Well, we really have felt very warmly welcomed, uh, despite the freezing cold that got drawn up for us. We have felt like this has been a family time. Uh, so thank you, and really just rolling out the red carpet. Uh, it, it has been amazing to experience some of what the Lord is doing here at Spring Arbor Free Methodist Church and Spring Arbor University. Uh, your reputation really does precede you. I, I hear stories about the impact that this church is having all the way over in Washington State, even further in East Africa. That's not an exaggeration. Uh, I hear many stories and see examples of the kind of impact this church is having. So it really is a privilege. Thank you for the invitation to be a part of this special tradition of Missions Month here at Spring Arbor Free Methodist. Uh, I also want to say a special thank you to those of you who have been offering me consolation about that last play in the Seahawk Super Bowl. I just needed to say that to a lot of people. That feels therapeutic for me. So thank you again, those of you who have been consoling me. Uh, it really is uh, a joy to be here this morning. And I want to begin this message with a question. And maybe you've thought about this question. Maybe you haven't. But I want to pose the question again. And it's a very simple question. But it's one I want us to stop and think about this morning. And, and that is this. Uh, have you ever wondered how it is that you and I are here worshiping Jesus this morning in Spring Arbor, Michigan, thousands of miles away from where Christianity began. I mean, here we are, thousands of miles away, worshiping Jesus from where Christianity began. Have you ever wondered why Christianity didn't just remain this regional religion somewhere over there in the Middle East where it all started? I mean, why did it spread? Why did it spread? Well, to put it simply, it spread because some 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked a few simple fishermen in the eye and he said, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of people. And then literally within one generation of Jesus' death and resurrection, his followers had taken the gospel throughout the Roman Empire and were even being accused of turning the world upside down. That was the reputation they were gaining for themselves. Acts 17, 6 says these, these people, these Christians, were turning the world upside down. By the way, don't you think it would be a great accusation to have leveled against us? Right? That, that you and I love Jesus so much, that, that you and I were so passionate about sharing Jesus with other people that, that we began to be accused of turning Spring Arbor upside down, turning Jackson upside down. Well, that was the reputation that the first followers of Jesus had in their world. And it's why by the time 100 AD came around, this, this little fledgling group had grown from 12 to 25,000. And then by 350 AD, this group, this Jesus movement had grown to 30 million. Right? The Jesus movement spread because every Christian was crystal clear about what Jesus had called them to. Jesus called them to take the gospel to their neighbors, to the nations, and to everyone in between. And that's the assignment that Jesus gave all of us in Matthew 28. I want you to listen to these words. I know you've heard these words dozens if not hundreds of times. Every time Missions Month comes around, this is like the classic scripture. But I want you to hear them again. And as I'm reading these words, I want you to try to put yourself in the scene with Jesus, with his disciples, the final statement that Jesus makes to his disciples before he ascends to heaven. Here it is in Matthew 28. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Again, try to imagine yourself in this scene. Try to put yourself in this context with Jesus speaking to his disciples for the very last time here on earth. Jesus has poured himself into these guys for three plus years. He's now giving them his last will and testament, if you will. His final words, his last opportunity to say to them what he really wants them to hear. To give them the assignment that he really wants them to carry out. And the assignment is very simple. Go and make disciples of all nations. And I imagine if I were one of the disciples, I would be hanging on Jesus' every word because this guy just six weeks earlier rose from the dead, conquered death. 
Again, think about that. Think about how attentive you would have been if you had watched someone be crucified and buried and then you, you saw evidence of him being raised from the dead and, and now here he is announcing to you, declaring to you that all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him and that he has a job for you to do. Right? I'd probably be pretty attentive and responsive to what that job was because this guy just conquered death. Well, Jesus' disciples did take that job seriously. In fact, they built their entire lives around obeying this one command to make disciples of all nations. To tell people about Jesus and then to teach those people what it meant to follow Jesus. That was it. That was their mission in life. That was their mission in life. And, and frankly, that's our mission too, right? Right? Because this job is not yet done. There are still people who need Jesus. Again, this is why I'm so encouraged to be here with you, to to be able to commend you for the incredible heritage that you have of local and global missions. I'm not not overstating it when when I say that I hear about your church all the time. And so part of what I want to say this morning is, is simply keep it up. Keep it up because there are still people in our world who haven't yet heard a clear presentation of the gospel. In fact, according to the Joshua Project, there are still 7,000 plus people groups in the world who have not yet even heard the name of Jesus. Again, I've been thinking about this stat and it's so difficult for me to get my mind wrapped around this stat because, because we live in a part of the world where there are churches everywhere and we even get to choose where we go to church, right? I mean, if you don't like the worship here, you just get in your car, you drive down the street, you go to a different church. If you don't like what Pastor Mark is preaching, you just get in your car, you drive down the street, you go to a different church. But there are over 7,000 people groups in the world who not only don't have a choice about where to worship, they've never even heard the name of Jesus. I've been thinking about a story Uh, about a missionary who just went to one of these 7,000 plus unreached people groups. It's a story that uh, continues to haunt me, honestly. It's a story that continues to haunt me. This missionary wants to engage this people group and so he begins to ask them a series of questions and, and some of the questions he asks them are questions like, how were people created? And this unreached people group responds with, we don't know. And, and so he asks them, who, who sends the rain to your crops? And they said, we do not know that either. And, and he asks them the question, what happens after you die? And, and they respond with, nobody has come to tell us that. Finally, the missionary asks them the question, have you ever heard of Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And they respond, we do not know Jesus. Maybe he lives in the next village. Maybe he lives in the next village. As this missionary continued to talk with this unreached people group, he found them to be very, very hospitable. In fact, they they eventually invite him into one of their homes. and, And that's when it happens for this missionary. One of the patriarchs of this people group returns back to where the missionary is and he hands him a Coca-Cola. He hands him a Coca-Cola and and this missionary is just undone. He doesn't even know how to respond because he's thinking about how a soft drink company in Atlanta, Georgia has done a better job getting brown sugar water to this unreached people group than followers of Jesus have done in getting the gospel to them. Again, I don't know why this story continues to haunt me, but it does. It's not a sin to drink Coca-Cola. I can't even look at a can of Coke, though, anymore without thinking about these 7,000 plus people groups around the world who have not yet heard the name of Jesus. It's such an indictment, you know, to think about a, a soft drink company doing a better job selling brown sugar water to unreached people groups than the church being able to get the gospel to these folks. Some of you know, our family spent several months this last year in Burundi, East Africa, helping to relaunch this pastoral training school that Pastor Mark was alluding to. What an incredible joy it was to teach the gospel to these students and to see their eyes open further to the good news of what Jesus has done for them. 
And then to hear them at the end of every course I would teach, I would hear them commit themselves and commit to God and commit to each other that, that they're going to take everything that they've learned and share it with people who don't yet know Jesus. That's the way that we would end almost every single module. They, they, would, they would have a time of testimony and they would talk about what they learned and then they would commit themselves to God and to each other that we are going to take everything we've learned about Jesus and share it with people who don't know him. I mean, that's how it's supposed to work, right? That, that those of us who, who, who know and love Jesus, that, that we would want to share that with others, right? Or at least that's how it's supposed to work. And, and not just in East Africa, but, but even here in Spring Arbor as well, amen? See, the church was never intended to be this place where, where you just come to learn and grow and get fed. But the church was intended to be this place where we come to learn and grow and get fed so that we can reproduce what we've received from Jesus with others. In fact, one of the litmus tests for whether we're really growing is whether or not we're actually sharing with others what we've received from Jesus. One of the litmus tests for spiritual growth is whether we're actually doing what Jesus told us to do when he said, go and make disciples. As Pastor Mark said, we're not just hearers of the word, we're doers of the word. That ought to be one of the spiritual litmus tests for whether we're growing. And please hear me on this point. Making disciples is not a special elective course for super Christians. It's a general ed requirement for all Christians. Right? This is why Charles Spurgeon, he said there are only two kinds of Christians. Two kinds of Christians. Missionaries and imposters. There are only two kinds of Christians. Missionaries and imposters. And I know the the weight of that kind of a quote, how that, that quote can feel like a dagger, and, and I'm not trying to beat anyone up this morning. I'm not trying to shake my finger at anyone. In fact, as I say that, I move to make my own personal confession. Okay, one of the things that I've been reflecting on about my own preaching ministry as a pastor in America is that in my 17 years of pastoral ministry, I really haven't done a great job of encouraging or equipping the people in my churches to step into their role in the Great Commission. Now, I've done a pretty good job calling people to respond to the preaching of the word. It's always been a conviction of mine that at the end of sermons, I'm inviting people to take specific steps in their walk with Jesus. I really can't preach God's word without calling people to respond to God's word. But here's the confession. Here's the confession. While God has helped me to call people to respond to his word, I haven't done a great job calling people to reproduce what they've received from God's word. And I really believe this is true in most churches in America, that even in churches that do a fairly good job of calling people to respond to the word, it rarely involves a call to reproduce what they've received from the word. And frankly, most of us Christians in America were receivers, not reproducers. Let me try to explain what I mean about this distinction between receivers and reproducers. David Platt explains it this way. He writes this, he says, Imagine being in Sudan. You walk into a thatched hut with a small group of Sudanese church leaders and you sit down to teach them God's word. As soon as you start, you lose eye contact with all of them. No one is looking at you and you hardly see their eyes the rest of the time. The reason is because they're writing down every word you say. They come up to you afterward and they say, teacher, we are going to take everything we have learned from God's word and teach it in our tribes. They were not listening to receive, but reproduce. By the way, this is literally what my students in Burundi would say to me at the end of every course. Teacher, we are going to take everything that we have just learned from God's word and we are going to share it with people who don't know Jesus. Again, they were listening not just to receive, but to reproduce. Platt goes on, he says, now journey with me to a contemporary worship service in the United States. A few people are taking notes, but for the most part, they're sitting passively in the audience. Others are focused on what the preacher is saying, but they're listening to God's word only to hear how it applies to their lives. The reality is, few are listening to reproduce. Few are listening to reproduce. We are, by nature, receivers. 
Even if we have this desire to learn God's word, so many of us still listen from this self-centered mindset that's always asking, what can I get out of this? What can I get out of this? But what if we were to change the question whenever we gathered to hear God's word? What if we began to ask the question, how can I listen to God's word so that I'm better equipped to teach this truth to someone else? And when I say that, I need to put this disclaimer out there so that you don't misunderstand. I, I'm, not, I'm not talking exclusively about you coming to church on Sunday, listening to what Pastor Mark teaches, and then going out to share only what he's saying. This principle applies no matter where you're learning from God. This principle applies regardless of whether or not it's a sermon podcast that you're listening to or an impactful book that you're reading or a Bible study that you're doing. The question is, are you looking to simply receive from God or reproduce what you're receiving from God? And that really is one of the critical shifts that needs to take place if we're going to take seriously Jesus' final words when he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Whether that's here in Spring Arbor or the ends of the world. God's purpose, God's end game, God's plan outlined from Genesis to Revelation is to rescue people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation in the world. That really is, has been God's plan from the very beginning. Listen to this example in Genesis chapter 12. God begins this rescue mission plan. Genesis 12, he, he makes this promise to Abram when he says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And listen, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Some translations say, and all people groups on earth will be blessed, touched through you. See, as far back as Genesis 12, the scope of God's rescue plan is crystal clear. All people groups on earth. And then you flip to the very end of the Bible. It's the theme throughout the Bible, but let me just give you the bookends. At the very end of our Bible, in Revelation chapter 5, the Apostle John is in heaven, and he hears this, he has this vision of heaven, he has, and he hears this song being sung about Jesus, the one who came to fulfill this promise that's being made to Abram in Genesis 12. And, and the song goes like this, Jesus, you are worthy because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe, every language, every people, and nation. Right? See, that's who Jesus died for, not just for you and me, but for people from every nation, tongue, and tribe on earth. That's why we're called to go and make disciples of all nations, because Jesus died for them. They were valuable enough to him that he was willing to die for them. And then just because, you know, John doesn't want us to miss this truth, two chapters later in Revelation 7, John has another vision where, where he catches this glimpse of who all will be in heaven at the end. And, and John writes this in Revelation 7, 9. He says, after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from, listen, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. From every nation, tribe, people, language. Do you know what this word every means in the Greek? It means every. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to make it less complicated. Jesus died so that there would be people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group standing before him, worshiping him, enjoying him for all eternity. And here's the good news. You know, sometimes people will, will try to guilt folks into going on mission trips because if they don't, then those people are all going to go to hell. I don't know how all of that works out. I know everyone comes through Jesus. But here's the, here's the promise of Revelation 7, 9. And I want to I try to compel you or motivate you in a different way. This vision from Revelation 7, 9 makes it crystal clear that every tribe, tongue, people group will be represented in heaven. Even the 7,000 plus people groups that are yet to be reached. That is for certain. The only question is whether or not you or I will experience the joy and the sense of purpose that comes from us participating in the vision for which God saved us. Right? So it's not just for the people that we're going to reach. It's because that is how God made us and why he saved us to join him in this great epic 
mission. See, we Christians, we, we sometimes forget that God's purpose for our lives is way bigger than just our lives. It's so easy in our culture to get me-centered, even in our churches, to get me-centered even in the way that we think about God. For example, if I were to ask the average Christian to summarize the message of Christianity, most likely I'd hear something along the lines of, well, God has a great plan for my life. I know he loves me. Right? That's kind of the message of Christianity. God loves me. He has a plan for my life. And this is true. Please don't hear me say this isn't true. It's true. It's just incomplete. Yes, God loves me and has a plan for my life, but his plan for my life is far bigger than just me. God's will for my life is to make disciples of all nations. And friends, if you are a follower of Jesus, that is God's will for your life too. In fact, I think about many of you who are at university right now. I know I was plagued with this question. I ask this question all the time. What is your will for my life, God? How many of you have ever wrestled with what's God's will for my life? Any of you, some of you, more than in first service, a few more than in first service, enough for two small groups. You're not telling me the truth. I know you're just not afraid. You're afraid to... St- I used to wrestle with that question of what is God's will for my life all the time. I used to pray about it. I used to ask God, show me what your will is for my life. Friends, I don't, I don't ask that question anymore. Because the more I read the scriptures, the more it's plainly stated God's will for my life is to make disciples of all nations. David Platt says it this way. He says, we don't need to ask God to reveal his will for our lives. Instead, we each need to ask God to align our lives with the will he's already revealed. God's will for us is to make disciples of all nations. Therefore, the question every disciple must ask is, how can I best make disciples of all nations? See, I don't need to pray anymore about what God's will is for my life because Jesus already told me his will. What I need to pray about is how God wants to use my life to make disciples. Whether I'm a teacher or a businessman, or a nurse, or a mechanic, or a student, or a plumber, or a salesman, or a stay-at-home mom, or a small group leader, or a doctor, or a janitor, or a grandma, whatever. God's will for your life is to make disciples of Jesus in all nations. And therefore, the question every follower of Jesus needs to ask is, how can I best make disciples of all nations? And folks, if that feels daunting this morning, if that feels kind of overwhelming this morning, then part of my mission has been accomplished. It should feel daunting. You should feel this sense of being overwhelmed. That's precisely why we need God's help and his presence, because we cannot take on this assignment in our own strength. We need him in order to carry it out. This is exactly why at the end of the Great Commission, Jesus promises us his presence. Did you catch that? At the very end of the Great Commission, the last verse in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. See, Jesus doesn't give us his presence just so that we can feel warm fuzzies. No, the promise of his presence is precisely connected to his purpose. To make disciples. Because that's God's will for your life. That's what Jesus is inviting you to. See, that's what Jesus is inviting you to. When he calls you to follow him, it's with a very specific purpose in mind. He's inviting you to make disciples of all nations. I always twinge a little bit when I hear pastors give invitations that make it sound like Jesus is just begging you to let him be a part of your life. Do you ever hear invitations like that? I I always twinge a little bit because I think, well, no, Jesus' end game is not to come into your life to help you with your agenda, right? To help you make more money or to help you find a husband or to help you bake better chocolate chip cookies or whatever it is that that you want to do. No. Jesus is inviting you to follow him so that you can make disciples of all nations. And again, if you're sitting here this morning, you're thinking, God couldn't do that kind of thing through me. I'm just too ordinary. I'm not spiritual enough to make disciples. If if you're sitting here and you're thinking that, please hear me when I say that God does not need extraordinary super Christians to do his thing through you in this world. He's simply looking for people who are willing to say yes to him. His spirit will do the rest. 
Friends, if you knew my past, you would know that that's true. You would know that I'm living proof of that. As I was praying this morning, even before first service in this awesome prayer room that you've got, I hope you utilize that. As I was praying, I was just again brought back to the truth of how God has used me and all of my insufficiency and inadequacy. When I stand up to preach, it's difficult for me to forget that I was just that punk insecure kid in college who dropped out of my public speaking class because I was afraid of giving a five-minute speech in front of my peers, even after I knew that God had called me into public ministry. Right? So I understand those feelings of insecurity and inadequacy, but let me tell you, when you buy into that, you are buying into a lie from the pit of hell. Because even as the little children were singing to us this morning, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you if you've given your life to Jesus. So you don't need to be some super extraordinary Christian. You just need to say yes to God. His spirit will do the rest. In fact, I want to share a story with you that illustrates uh, how God will use even our feeble obedience to advance his kingdom if we will simply surrender ourselves to his will for our life. It's one of my favorite stories of how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. It's the story of a young man named Edward Kimball, this uh, shy and reserved guy who lived in Boston in the 1800s. Richard Stearns, the president of World Vision, he tells this story of Edward Kimball's legacy and impact on the world. Stearns writes this. He says, Edward Kimball taught Sunday school at his church because he felt called to invest himself in the lives of the next generation. To get to know his students better, Edward would often visit them during the week where they lived or worked. One Sunday, a challenging teenager showed up in his class. The boy was 17, rough, poorly educated, prone to outbursts of anger and profanity. Edward thought about how he might reach this boy, and, and so one day he decided to visit him at the shoe store where he worked. Kimball passed by the store trying to get up the courage to speak to the boy, trying to figure out what he would say to this boy. Finally, he entered the store and found the boy in the back, wrapping shoes and putting them on the shelves. Edward went to him, simply put his hand on the young man's shoulder and mumbled some words about Christ's love for him. Kimball later confessed that he felt like he failed in his sharing of the gospel. But apparently, his timing was just right. Because right there in the shoe store, the boy committed his life to Christ. His name, Dwight L. Moody. Some of you know that name. Dwight L. Moody became probably the most successful evangelist of the 19th century, preaching the gospel to an estimated 100 million people during his lifetime, traveling perhaps a million miles before the time of radio, television, automobiles, or air travel. But the story actually gets better. Moody himself in 1879 was instrumental in the conversion of another man, F.B. Meyer, who also grew up to become a minister. Meyer then mentored, mentored J.W. Chapman and led him to Christ. Chapman also became a pastor and evangelist and started an outreach ministry to professional baseball players. One of the players he met, Billy Sunday, became Chapman's assistant for many of his evangelistic meetings. In time, Billy Sunday, having learned to preach from Chapman, started to hold his own evangelistic meetings. Billy Sunday went on to become the greatest evangelist of the first two decades of the 20th century. One of his revivals in Charlotte, North Carolina in the 1920s was so successful that an associate of his named Mordecai Ham who years earlier had given his life to Christ at one of these crusades, was asked to come back to Charlotte to hold a second series of meetings. On one of the final nights when Ham was preaching, a gangly teenager came forward and responded to the call to give your life to Christ. His name was Billy Graham. And of course, it's difficult to even estimate how many people Billy Graham has preached to. Conservative estimates put it at him preaching the gospel to hundreds of millions of people, millions of whom have come to faith in Christ. And again, my point in sharing this story, I hope you can connect the dots, my point in sharing this story is to highlight that this legacy of millions of people coming to faith in Christ, this legacy began not with a pastor, 
not with an evangelist, not even with someone who thought that they were particularly gifted in evangelism. This legacy of millions of people coming to faith in Christ began with a simple, shy man named Edward Kimball. Just this ordinary guy who didn't feel very gifted in sharing his faith, but who was trying to be obedient to Jesus' final words, go, make disciples. He was just trying to be obedient to what Jesus says. Go and make disciples. See, God doesn't need extraordinary super Christians to do his thing in the world. He's just looking for people who are willing to say yes to him. His spirit will do the rest. So before I close, I want to invite you to consider a few potential next steps this morning as a way of being a doer of the word. As a way of responding to Jesus' final words to his followers in Matthew 28, which includes you and me, if we've said we want to be followers of Jesus. Number one, number one, commit today to making the shift from being a receiver to becoming a reproducer. In other ways, begin to look for ways to share what you're learning with others, not just on Sunday mornings, but out of your own personal readings of God's word or when you listen to an impactful podcast or when you're reading an inspiring book. Again, don't misunderstand me. I want you to to listen for what God might want to say to you, but then ask the Lord if there's anyone else with whom he would have you share it. Make the shift from being just a receiver to becoming a reproducer. Number two, go on a short-term mission trip. Go on a short-term mission trip. Folks, this church has an incredible missions legacy. Take advantage of the opportunities that you've got here at Spring Arbor Free Methodist. And more importantly than that, take seriously Jesus' final words when he says go. And don't misunderstand me when I invite you here in a moment to pray about going, okay? When I say pray about it, I'm not... I'm not encouraging you to ask God to show you if he wants you to go. I'm encouraging you to ask God to show you if he wants you to stay. Otherwise, go. Right? We should assume that Jesus wants us to go and make disciples unless he tells us to stay. Right? I mean, given what Jesus has already plainly told us in his word, shouldn't we ask him to make it clear if he doesn't want us to go? Otherwise, we already have his marching orders from from Matthew 28. Go. Unfortunately, here's how a lot of Christians have translated Jesus' final words in Matthew 28, right? We're, we understand, yes, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, but then it, it kind of sounds like this in our minds. Therefore, pray about whether you should go, right? If, if you feel okay about going, then go. If you feel a, a warm sensation here, then go. If, if, you, if you have fears or concerns, though, or if you've got family members or friends who, who, who aren't sure if it's a good idea, then you should probably stay, In fact, why don't you just stay unless I give you a sign from heaven that you should go? And then we wait for the sign from heaven. And of course, what's so ironic is that we already have a sign from heaven. Jesus, before he ascends to heaven, the final thing he says to us is go, make disciples of all nations. There's your sign. There's your sign from heaven. See, some of you already know that you're supposed to take a short-term mission trip. You've known this for a few years and you just find yourself rationalizing or justifying or neglecting. And again, I know some of you are in a situation that you can't. You're not able-bodied or you've got some pretty crazy extenuating circumstances. You know who you are. If you're really fuzzy, though, about whether or not you're in that camp, talk to Pastor Mark or any of the staff. They'll shoot straight with you, right? They'll let you know if you've got extenuating circumstances. If you don't, here's your sign. Go. So pray. Ask God to show you if he wants you to stay. Otherwise, go. Number three, uh, talk to, text, email, Facebook, someone about Jesus. And I want to encourage you to do this this week. Sometimes we have such a tendency to wait for the perfect opportunity to share about Christ that we miss out on all of the good opportunities that are right in front of us. And I have been the chief of sinners on this point. I've been guilty of this, waiting for, quote, just the right time to say something about Jesus instead of just taking advantage of the sphere of influence that I've got to say Jesus out loud. And I gotta put put this disclaimer out there as well because I don't want you to be confused on this point. God is not going to evaluate you at the end of your life on the basis of how many people you led to Jesus. 
Besides, I don't believe that anyone can lead someone to Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit can lead someone to Jesus. We're simply vessels. Right? Our job is to share the message of the gospel as best as we can, as inadequately as we will. God's job is to work in a human heart such that when they hear the message, when they see the message, they're moved to respond to the message. The question for us is, are we willing to say Jesus out loud? Are we willing to say Jesus out loud? Sometimes it really is that simple. In fact, there's uh, actually a very simple reason that the church is growing so rapidly around the world, even in places where persecution against Christians is just brutal. Uh, I was recently reading about the church growth strategy in one of these places. It's an incredibly simple strategy. I think we should adopt it. I'll let you decide whether or not you want to adopt it. It's a three-step process, and I'm not making this up. Here is the church growth strategy. On the first day that people come to Christ, they're told to number one, make a list of every unbeliever they know. And then number two, circle the names of the 10 people on that list who are least likely to kill them if they speak about Christ. And then number three, go share Christ with those 10 people as soon as possible. That's the church growth strategy. That's it. That's literally how the church grows. So let me ask you this morning. Do you have someone in your life who doesn't yet know Jesus, who you're pretty sure won't kill you if you share Jesus with them? And then finally, number four, surrender yourself to Jesus, giving him permission to use you however he wants, whenever he wants, wherever he wants. Again, I don't know where all of you are this morning, but maybe you're here today and you would admit that, that you've kind of been playing games with God. Like you would say, yeah, Jesus is my savior, but, but he's not really my Lord. I'm the one who's pretty much calling all of the shots in my life. I, I believe in Jesus, but, but I kind of want Jesus to fit into my will for my life. If that's you, maybe today is the day that you surrender yourself to Jesus and his will for your life. To make disciples of all nations, whether it's here in Spring Arbor or in Burundi, East Africa or anywhere in between. And remember, God doesn't need extraordinary, super spiritual Christians to do his thing through you. He's just looking for you to surrender yourself to him. Giving him permission to use you however he wants, whenever he wants, wherever he wants. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your great sacrifice on the cross, purchasing sinners like me. I thank you for your incredible victory over the grave, rising from the dead to validate that that work on the cross is finished, and then filling us with your Holy Spirit so that we could not only live the life of joy and peace and abundant life that you have for us, but so that we might be able to join you in this rescue mission of the planet. So Lord, wherever you're speaking to hearts right now, I pray that you would apply the truth of your word to their specific circumstances and then empower them to follow you in whatever next step you're calling them to take. In Jesus' name, we all agreed and said, amen.